Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. You probably could have predicted it. After Yellowstone National Park's spring opening was delayed by the coronavirus pandemic, the park's south and east entrances finally opened to visitors last week. And three days after that opening, a bison that felt a visitor had gotten too close butted her to the ground. Fortunately, the woman escaped without any serious injuries. Other stories we passed on at National Parks Traveler included one about the likelihood that Isle Royal National Park in Michigan will remain closed all summer due to the coronavirus pandemic. We also passed on that Padre Island National Seashore in Texas won't have Kemp's Ridley Sea Turtle hatchling releases open to the public this year, and that the National Park Service has weakened its hunting regulations at national preserves in Alaska at the request of the Trump administration. You can find those and other stories about national parks and protected areas at nationalparkstraveler.org. In this week's program, we're joined by Costa Dillon, a National Park Service veteran who ended his long career as superintendent of Indiana Dunes National Park. Our conversation revolves around a novel management decision in Thailand to close that country's national parks every year for two months to give wildlife a break from humans. Would such a move be good for America's national parks? Would the Park Service, politicians, and gateway towns agree to such annual closures? It's an interesting idea. Lynn Riddick also returns this week with a story about a roughly 1,200-mile extension to the Lewis and Clark Trail. It's an eastward extension that runs from St. Louis to Pittsburgh, one that adds a great deal of history to the National Historic Trail. The coronavirus pandemic has had great impact on the national park system. Many parks were closed for weeks or months beyond their usual seasonal openings. And when they have reopened, the rules have changed in terms of employee housing for the park service, concessionaires, and other businesses that operate in the parks. We're seeing limits on the number of people allowed in visitor centers, if the centers are even open, and shuttle bus systems are being idled for the summer until the pandemic can be brought under control. Another thing that has changed are the movements of wildlife. There have been reports of bears and coyotes and bighorn sheep and other animals turning up in places they normally wouldn't use because humans were there. Without humans, well, the wildlife is reclaiming its traditional habitat. That behavior hasn't gone unnoticed. Recently, Thailand's Department of National Parks, Wildlife, and Plant Conservation announced that it would temporarily close national parks nationwide every year, even after COVID-19 is a thing of the past. The department's director says that absence of tourists leads to wildlife recovery, and that would be wise to close parks for a couple of months every year. To kick around that idea, we're joined today by Costa Dillon, a former National Park Service superintendent, a long-term veteran of the Park Service, and... uh, Costa, I'm glad you joined us today. I'm really curious about what you think of that proposal. Well, thanks. Uh, glad to be able to uh, do this. The um, I am familiar somewhat with Thailand's national parks. I've uh, done some work uh, cooperatively with uh, Khao Yai National Park uh, through the um, International Conservation Corps. And that's one of the parks that was uh, highlighted in the story, showed a picture of a sun bear crossing a road and said, that's pretty unusual. And I can say it is very unusual to see a, a sun bear at Khao Yai because they're so uh, reclusive. It's a, um, in some ways, Thailand's national parks uh, want to model the U.S. Park Service and how we manage our parks. That's why we uh, have a, a cooperative program uh, working with them. But in other ways, they're also more progressive than us. Certainly, they don't match our interpretation and visitor services. But already, Khao Yai National Park closes at night. They close all their main roads from sunset to sunrise so that uh, the wildlife will not get hit by cars, which, of course, Hmm. is one of the leading causes of death of major wildlife in parks like Yellowstone is they're hit by cars. Mm -hmm. So this idea that they would uh, close for a few months of the year for 
for recovery is kind of in line with some of the forward thinking Thailand's national parks already do. How big is that national park in, in acres? Can you put a number on it? Mm, I can't remember offhand, but it's roughly equivalent to, say, Great Smoky Mountains. But also there are a number of conservation areas attached to it, adjacent to it, that are not national parks, but they're conservation areas. So altogether, it's an enormous protected uh, ecosystem. It's only and only about two hours drive from Bangkok, so it gets a mm-hmm. lot of visitors. Yeah, yeah. But it sounds like there's no uh, real infrastructure, um, at least in terms of uh, lodges, overnight lodges or, or campgrounds. The way uh, Thailand works is all of their, uh, almost all of their lodging uh, is outside the park. So there are a lot of uh, hotels and resorts uh, around Khao Yai National Park, only a few places inside. They don't have a concession type system the way the U.S. does. The park service itself has a, some rental areas and some campgrounds in the park. But the vast majority of people who go to Khao Yai stay at the resorts uh, just outside the park boundary. Hmm. You know, for, for years I've been saying it'd be nice if, if we could let some of these parks rest for a year and, and let the, uh, the grasses and the vegetation come back, the meadows recovery and, and whatnot. Um, but I don't know if it would work in the United States, would it? And closing parks to visitor use is antithetical to uh, the way the national parks operate. There, as far as I know, there's only one national park that's not open to the public. Uh, mm-hmm. is It's the only, only park that has no public use. So it's tough for the National Park Service under its current management philosophy to close areas to public use. Now, that isn't to say it hasn't been done, but mostly it's been done under the umbrella of the Endangered Species Act, uh, closing specific areas for a specific time for a specific species recovery, rather than mm-hmm. closing an area for ecosystem recovery. But at the same time, with the uh, the current management situation with the coronavirus pandemic and the, and the efforts to carefully manage parks with uh, social distancing and, and health concerns, now might be a, a good time to explore some of these ideas, no? I mean, think of all the benefits that uh, you could have for the ecosystem as a whole, uh, wildlife, uh, perhaps give uh, crews a chance to uh, tackle some of that maintenance backlog without the, uh, the throngs of visitors surrounding um, and using those facilities at the same time. Well, that, that certainly is a, a benefit that I think some parks are taking advantage of, <clears throat> while there are no visitors there right now. but. It, it's more than that. The National Park Service, by law and policy, is required to maintain park areas so that they don't suffer impairment. And impairment mm-hmm. is a legal term Congress defined in, um, in law, and the Park Service further defines in its management policies. And that is um, when a park resources um, impair, that means it's it's... Um, suffered damage or deterioration inconsistent with the park's purposes um, or protection of its major cultural values and so forth, then the park is supposed to take action to negate that impairment or reverse that impairment. And if, if you read the management policies, the interesting thing is it's mostly geared to what you should take into consideration before you take an action so you won't have impairment. It doesn't, it's not as specific and in addressing what you should do if you already see impairment and now do something about it. It, it right. it's, a, it's on the front end, not on the back end. <laughs> and right. so I think a lot of superintendents are afraid to take impairment action. Yeah, and I, I, I struggle with that, um, and, and certainly I, I'm just a, an observer on the outside. I don't know all the challenges that they face internally um, in terms of, uh, I mean, there's great pressure not only from politicians but from gateway communities and, and the economy that the, the parks support. But at the same time, you know, there was a, a case in Yellowstone a couple of years ago where they were having such a problem with um, automobile traffic around Grand Prismatic Spring that... Instead of trying to limit the traffic, they just built a new parking lot and, and built a new overlook down at Zion National Park. You know, we've reported on this at The Traveler over the years. There are, I think, 13 miles of official trail in Zion Canyon and um, roughly 30 miles of 
of unofficial social trails that have been created. And you can just go around the the park system and, and point to these different instances or examples of where the the visitation is getting ahead of certainly the park staff and impacting the resources. I know um, public employees for environmental responsibility um, almost annually brings up uh, why aren't the park superintendents um, implementing carrying capacities as uh, the 1978 uh, Redwoods Act required them to do. And so, yeah, it's certainly a, a momentous decision in, um, to close a park or to implement carrying capacities. And, and so what do we do? Do we just sit here and watch uh, greater impairment and degradation? There, there, you have a lot of questions in that. <laughs> <laughs> which Sorry. Is that I would be happy to address. Uh, there's a lot to uh, unpack there. A lot of, you're right, a lot of the um, reluctance by superintendents is because they're afraid of angering visitors or gateway communities or politicians and so forth. Uh, and, and certainly that's a reasonable consideration under a lot of circumstances. But I've found in my experience, it's not as controversial as you may think, as long as you communicate well to the public and identify what those impacts might be so that you can work with your local communities and businesses and concessioners and so forth. And I'll just to give you an example, when I was the superintendent of what is now Indiana Dunes National Park, the most popular site in the park is a place called Mount Baldy, which was a large uh, shifting dune. And right. it, it's shifting because it's been denuded of vegetation largely. Uh, mm -hmm. When I got there, everybody's major identification of the threat, as they put it to me, was the dune is threatening the parking lot. It's going to overtake the parking lot. And I said, no, you're looking at it backwards. The parking lot <laughs> is threatening the dune. The dune is doing what it's supposed to do. It's a natural thing, and it's our job to um, let um, natural conditions uh, work at a park. It's our responsibility to get the parking lot out of the way, not 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 keep putting up some sort of barriers to stop the dune from moving. You're looking at it uh, backwards. Right. So, but But there was a way to do both, which was we decided to close areas of the dune for uh, recovery of vegetation, and in, in many cases, we planted vegetation to start to try to slow down that what was an artificial dune migration because of the denuding. People like to climb up the dune, roll down it, and fly down it, and so forth. Right. And that was working. It, it just so happened that just before I retired, and uh, this made national news, a boy sunk into a hole in that dune, and everybody thought, he was he was uh, gone for good, and we managed to recover him after a couple of hours, and he survived. It was a, a miracle recovery, but that meant the dune was going to be closed for another three years. It only partially reopened this last year, in order to um, protect public safety, which is the primary reason why we close areas and parks is safety. You know, there, there's a landslide in this area. The the burn area isn't safe. The the bears are foraging here and so forth. So uh, we closed for safety and it was, but the species recovery was allowed because of that to uh, accelerate during that closure. We had already closed parts of the dune. Now the whole dune was closed for three to four years and it's shown a significant improvement on vegetation growing on the dune. And of course, the, it's now up to the park to kind of uh, restrict visitor use so that it doesn't um, become as bad as it was before. Mm -hmm. And everybody said, oh, this isn't going to work. It's the number one most visited part of the park. We're going to get beat up in the press. Uh, we're going to, uh, the neighboring communities will be irate and so forth. And none of that happened. None of that happened. Because we, everybody seemed to recognize what a valuable part of the park that was. And we explained why our work was trying to protect it. And, and that uh, it was um, going to be better, you know, when we finish. And people went along with it. We got almost no pushback, almost no complaints. Hmm. Um, and for Indiana Dunes National Park, that, it's the equivalent of closing Old Faithful in Yellowstone. That's how popular it was. And wow. it, it worked. So I, I think superintendents sometimes uh, underestimate the public. I think there are ways to do these things that, as I said, as long as you bring people in, 
you talk to your partners and and um, community and help them understand why this is the right thing to do, you can make things happen. Yeah. And, and and interestingly, this is not a new question that comes up. I mean, back in the 1950s, um, a Utah writer, Bernard DeVoto, wrote a piece, I think, for Harper's Magazine, We Must Close the Parks or Let's Close the Parks. And he recounted the litany of um, insults, if you will, that the parks were suffering because of a lack of funding and uh, insufficient uh, facilities and, and overcrowding and whatnot. And uh, Wallace Stegner, who was best known for his environmental and conservation writing, actually appeared in a anthology of best sports writing that uh, Sports Illustrated put out, talking about the same thing and, and how the parks are suffering from uh, too many people and, and not enough uh, resources, whether at staffing resources or, or funding. Uh, we're talking today with Costa Dillon, a longtime National Park Service manager, uh, now retired, about the possibility of perhaps closing national parks for a month or two every year, not just uh, during times of uh, coronavirus pandemic. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences that it offers endure for generations to come. You can show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, a training center, a conference center, and a leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Costa, you have a situation there in Southern California that might benefit from a closure the tide pools at Cabrillo National Monument, as I understand it, are the only federally protected tide pools on the coast of Southern California, um, not counting Channel Islands. And yet there's been a, a change in the condition of those tide pools. They are, yes. The, they are, I've worked on and off at Cabrillo. Started, I started my Park Service career as a volunteer there in 1976. So I've been able to see the, the park changes over 40 plus years. And when I started as a volunteer, the tide pools were exemplary abundance of wildlife. You could see nudibracs and sea stars and sea slugs and anemones and sculpin and, and you name it. It was just amazing to go in those tide pools and see what was there. When I had a chance to um, temporarily work there last two years ago, I was appalled to, to see the tide pools, it essentially denuded of all, almost all life, including anemones, which are almost the last thing to go because anemones and mussels, which are attached to the rocks. Mm -hmm. And, and no, no question, the, what's called sea star wasting disease has affected the, the starfish. It, that, that's something that's uh, it's a natural thing in the ecosystem. It's been going on since 2013. It, it may be exacerbated by global warming, but you know, sea star wasting disease certainly had an effect. But also, it's just the sheer number of visitors that go in those tide pools, tens of thousands of them every year. And um, there's not always a volunteer or park service employee to monitor what's going on. And the major impact to tide pools, other than sea star wasting, is people taking stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Either they uh, lift it out of the water to the point where it won't survive, even if they put it back, or they take it home 
uh, souvenirs. And I'm, I am relatively certain that a lot of the impact of the, of the Cabrillo tide pools are from people, not from natural conditions. Mm -hmm. And I think that it would be worth the park's time to experiment and see what's going on. The tide pools are easily closed at Cabrillo because of where they're located. Um, the parking areas can be easily sealed and there's no adjacent place you can walk to the tide pools from. So they would be sealed off. And if they, if they were to institute an inventory and monitoring program, they could establish a baseline and then wait, I would say at least three years and see if anything changes. And if it does, what, what changes? Mm -hmm. Not only would this science be valuable for Cabrillo, I think it would apply to all the tide pools on the coast of California. That would be information that could readily be shared with the state parks and the Forest Service, which owns some, some tide pools on the central coast, uh, with Channel Islands, uh, with the county parks and beaches and other areas and so forth of how to manage tide pools. And I think the park could take it to an advantage. And that is, this is what a great opportunity for a citizen science program is to en enlist the public in, in signing up as volunteers to be part of the inventory and monitoring program, that they can go down and help take photographs, count species, um, take water samples, temperature of the water, and so forth, all the things you do in inv inventory and monitoring. So now it's not just, hey, you're closed, you're not welcome. It's, hey, we're closed and we want you to help us. Yeah. So that uh, they, they don't feel like they're shut out as much as they're part of the solution. Uh, and and turn it into an advantage. It it will not. There are other tide pools people can go to in San Diego that belong to the city and so forth. Uh, there there's lots of other coast you can go to. There's no swimming or surfing or anything allowed at Cabrillo, so there's no recreational use that would be impacted. Mm -hmm. And I I just don't think it would be uh, as uh, disruptive in the public's mind as some people might fear. I think the public would support such a thing. Any idea why the park hasn't closed off the tide pools to let them recover? Have you had a chance to, to talk to some of the managers there? No, I don't know what the superintendent's thinking is on it. Certainly, um, like any superintendent, she's got a lot of things going on. But I, 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 I don't know why she might not do it. Because there's another extra benefit, which is the trails along the tide pool coast are also like a lot of trails, a lot of social trails have developed. And so it would also give time for the land uh, resource adjacent to the tide pools to recover and reinstitute the formal trails and reduce the uh, informal trails that have developed in that area. So there's, there's a lot of benefits. And I, I, think, it's worth, I think it's worth trying, in my, in, in my opinion. Yeah, I think there's lots of places across the national park system that could certainly benefit from a rest. Um, I am wondering about um, Thailand's proposal to to close the parks for a couple months. You know, if you do that and and wildlife get reaccustomed, as it were, to a landscape without all the humans around, any idea if you would encounter more human wildlife conflicts when the parks are open back up to the public? Certainly that's possible, but on the other hand, I would look at that as, and I, <laughs> hold, hear me out here, <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is, if the wildlife feels like they can be in other places, then again, to go back to my original, my description of Mount Baldy, it's the park service's job to figure out a way to get the visitors out of the wildlife's way, not the other way around. Right. You know, famous, the, the famous example is, when they stopped feeding bears in the garbage dumps at Yellowstone back in the 60s, and the public couldn't see bears anymore because they no longer were walking up to the road. And, and some people didn't like that. They liked going to Yellowstone because the bears came to my car window and I could feed them. But nobody who goes to Yellowstone now remembers the garbage dumps, unless they're in their 80s or 90s. And so it's not an issue anymore. Mm -hmm. they, that is, the visitation um, changed in order to uh, accommodate the bears. And, and I think if we were to see wildlife all of a sudden want to show up in the campgrounds of things where they weren't before, there are ways we can manage for that so that you reach a, a different kind of equilibrium, you reach a different kind of, of visitor patterns. I, I think uh, you know 
the fishing bridge campground again at Yellowstone and how it was really relocated because of where the bears were. Those kinds of things can be done. And that's why you would wanna do um, inventory and monitoring when you, when you do this so that you can map where things are occurring, where the wildlife is going and so forth. Sure. Then the only issue you have to deal with is the human equation. Um, I, I can't ignore the fact that uh, Yellowstone just reopened uh, this past Monday and on Wednesday, I think it was, or Thursday, Thursday, um, this past week, a woman was butted to the ground by a bison. She got too close. Yeah. And so... Um, and that's, that's going to always be a challenge. Now, you, you spoke earlier about carrying capacities and nobody's ever been able to definitively determine a method of setting carry capacities for natural areas mm -hmm. and for cultural sites you know how many how many pounds per square foot can you have on this old floor but there was a study done and I might get the park wrong I think it was the Chattahoochee River a number of years ago where the park was concerned because there were just too many people rafting on this river and they were like bumper to bumper and so they asked people what they thought of it and the Primary response is what? There were other people here. <laughs> they were so absorbed in having a good time themselves, the the, the rest of the people didn't didn't bother them at all. So, and and thus we can demonstrate that there are too many people on this trail that are you now the trail is eroding or something like that. It's hard to set a carrying capacity for a natural area because the public is much more focused on whatever that fantastic resource they're looking at. And the only time yeah. they notice people is when they happen to be in their photo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, the, the, the greater trick is training people to um, be cognizant of uh, the natural conditions around them and to give the wildlife enough, enough room. So they're not um, putting themselves or the wildlife in danger. And, and that is absolutely. And that it obviously with 400 plus parts, it doesn't apply to just Yellowstone that people have, that, that mistaken impression that somehow wildlife isn't wild. Right. And um, which, which does seem to be more prevalent in parks that have entrance stations and collect the fee, because now you feel like you've entered some sort of controlled area. Parks that do not have entrance stations have less of that kind of expectation in the public's mind that this is somehow, somehow this wildlife is different than just normal wildlife wandering around it's an interesting type of thing yeah interesting concept psychologically we've been talking today with costa dillon a longtime national park service manager now retired about a proposal they're pushing forward in thailand to um, close their national parks for a couple months every year to allow wildlife to recover, as it were, from the crush of human visitation. Costa, thanks so much for joining me today. Um, it's an interesting issue, I think, that we should continue to explore because, as, as you noted, um, these are not isolated instances at Yellowstone or at Cabrillo or at Yosemite where we've got uh, too much human use. And it'd be nice to, to take a bigger look at what's going on around the park system in terms of visitation and whether parks should close down for a short period every year. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It's also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Foggy this morning, according to custom. 
set out at half past seven and in about 200 paces stuck on a riffle, all hands obliged to get out. So begins the September 7th, 1803 journal entry of Meriwether Lewis, describing one of many stops and starts along the Ohio River on the way to meet his co-captain William Clark in Illinois. The early part of the Lewis and Clark journey, down the Ohio and up the Mississippi, is now better showcased thanks to the 1,200-mile extension of the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail. The extension is a string of landmarks, historic sites, museums, and monuments in six additional states. With the trailhead now starting in Pittsburgh, the extension includes points of interest in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois. Administered by the National Park Service and managed by different local, state, private, and tribal entities, this new part of the trail provides a preface of sorts to the story of the Corps of Discovery as it prepared to venture into the unknown parts of the continent in search of a water route to the Pacific. And here to connect the dots along the extension is Mark Weekly, superintendent of the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail. He's joining me from the trail's headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska. Hi, Mark. Welcome to The Traveler. Lynn, it's really great to be here today. I'm very excited to talk to you about the extended Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail. Well, as you know, when it comes to the Lewis and Clark story, there really is no end to interesting parts of the trip to talk about. But today I wanted to ask you specifically about the 1,200-mile trail extension and the historic spots along the Ohio and Mississippi River before the Corps of Discovery got fully underway on the Missouri River. But first, tell me what was involved in establishing this extension and how it ties into the National Trails System Act and the existing Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail. Well, the process of extending the trail started with uh, partners and citizens who really felt that the story was not complete. When the bicentennial celebration or commemoration occurred in 2003 to 2006, there was a recognition of the fact that a lot of the story happened in the East. And during the bicentennial commemoration, a lot of that story took place in the East. And also, if you look at Undaunted Courage, Stephen Ambrose was one of the very first, if not the first, to actually include in his telling of the Lewis and Clark expedition tale, talking about kind of the the route before they got to Wood River, Illinois. Most people just talked about the the trail and the expedition as starting in Wood River, Illinois, near St. Louis. So all these things came together and there became an interest in extending the trail. In 2008, Congress directed the National Park Service to conduct a study basically what we call a feasibility and suitability study to assess whether this is historically appropriate and it could be managed by the National Park Service. That study was then completed. It went to Congress and Congress chose to act on that legislation and the wishes of their constituents to extend the trail from Wood River, Illinois to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And that happened last year uh, in 2019. Roughly how many new historic locations are part of the extension, and what are some of the broad categories they fall into? Well, I think there, there are a number of them, and I, I hate to give a number, but there's, there's probably, I would say, roughly a dozen uh, what I call historic sites, and those are the ones I'm thinking of that actually have a direct tie in connection to the expedition. Lewis was there, or Lewis and Clark were there, or they mentioned it in the journals, or something happened. And so there's those sites that have a very close tie with it. But then there are other historic sites that may have a relation to Lewis or Clark, perhaps after the expedition, that are relevant and important to the overall Lewis and Clark story, but they're not as directly related to the expedition itself. Uh, Then also, when you look at the Trail Corridor, you have to remember this is not a, a nice square national park. This is a national historic trail. So we think of it as a broad corridor. And when you look at that, there may be a number of really important historic sites within that corridor that may provide you history about 18th century history, 19th century history, or give other background of that area that maybe not really focus on Lewis and Clark, but certainly help you understand the broader perspective. 
And so we like to, you know, work with those partners as well. And we think it's important to recognize that when you're traveling along a National Historic Trail, particularly like the Lewis and Clark Trail, there are a multitude of visitor centers and historic sites and really wonderful places to stop and learn about the expedition, but also learn about the, the broader history in that area. Were there discussions about other locations where Lewis prepared for the trip, like Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, Philadelphia, and Frederick, Maryland? There certainly were many other sites. Uh, A lot of people have argued that you really have to say the expedition started at at Monticello with Thomas Jefferson. Certainly planning went on there. Planning went on at the White House. Meriwether Lewis and President Jefferson certainly discussed and talked about it, looked at maps there. Uh, And then there were sites like Harper's Ferry where they had a lot of provisions and equipment created or built or ordered for the expedition. Lewis spent a lot of time in Philadelphia studying and learning about botany and medicine. So there are many sites that are not on the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail, but in many, many ways, they're very much a part of the overall story. Now, Meriwether Lewis's goal was to reach the Missouri River by September 1st, 1803. But he didn't even start down the Ohio River from Pittsburgh till August 31st. So the setbacks that caused the delay almost seem comical. There were delays with the delivery of weapons and ammunition, delays in the completion of the keelboat, and Lewis didn't even know until the end of July whether Captain William Clark would accept his offer to join him on the expedition. So tell me a little bit more about these setbacks and the pressure from President Thomas Jefferson to get the show on the road. Well, I I think there was a lot of pressure, and I think maybe some of the most of it was from Meriwether Lewis himself. This he wanted this to happen. If I may indulge you for just a minute, I'd like to read one of my favorite passages from Undaunted Courage, where it describes uh, Lewis's effort to get this very important keelboat constructed and ready to go. And uh, this is around the end of of August, and this is from Undaunted Courage. To hurry the builder along, Lewis tried getting on his knees. He tried shouting and cursing. (laughs) And then we have a quote from Lewis that says, Neither threats, persuasion, or any other means which I could devise were sufficient to procure the completion of the work sooner than the 31st of August. He had hoped that he would be on his way by July 20th, and at the latest August 1st. By the time the boat was ready, the river had fallen so low, and then there's a quote from Lewis saying, those who pretended to understand and be acquainted with navigation of the river declare it impractical to descend it. The last sentence of this paragraph is, Lewis was going anyway. And I think in some ways that is a really wonderful passage because Lewis faced multiple obstacles just getting started. He had getting equipment, getting supplies, getting men, trying to find out, you know, who his team was going to be, if if Captain Clark was going to join him. And he was not stopped by this. He was still going to go anyway, even though the expert said, don't go down the river at this point. There's not enough water. You'll never make it. His approach was, I am going to go. And I think what's interesting is when he did go, he ran into multiple obstacles again and again and again. And for me, that's one of the really remarkable parts of this story, you know, really was, I, I think, what inspired the, the title of Stephen Ambrose's book, Undaunted Courage. Uh, but it was an astounding determination that we are going to do this. And there didn't ever seem to be any question about the fact that they were going to do it. It was just something we're going to do. Left Pittsburgh this day at 11 o'clock with a party of 11 hands, seven of which are soldiers, a pilot, and three young men on trial, they having proposed to go with me throughout the voyage. Called the hands of board and proceeded through a ripple of McKee's Rock, where we were obliged to get out all hands and lift the boat over about 30 yards. The river is extremely low, is said to be more so than it has been known for four years. Now, the trail extension begins at Point State Park in Pittsburgh, 
where the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers meet to form the Ohio River, Lewis was finally able to shove off on August 31st. How many miles did he hope to go each day, and what was the reality given the conditions of the Ohio River? I'm not entirely sure how many miles at that point he thought he'd go earlier in the year he thought he could make very substantial headway each day. On his first day, he he started off, he went three miles. He stopped at Bruno's Island uh, to demonstrate the air rifle, which was a remarkable piece of technology at that time. They they fired a number of shots. This was a, a rifle that they pumped up with air that had up to like four or five hundred pounds of pressure. And people said it was was comparable to a Kentucky rifle of the time in its effectiveness. It was passed to a person who accidentally fired it. A woman was hit in the head, not seriously, but it was certainly an upsetting thing. So this is three miles from Point State Park. <laughs> this is the first mishap. Well, here's what Lewis said in his journal about that accidental shooting. The ball passed through the head of a woman about 40 yards distance, cutting her temple about the fourth of the diameter of the ball. She fell instantly, the blood gushing from her temple. We were all in the greatest consternation, supposed that she was dead by. In a minute, she revived to our inexpressible satisfaction, and by examination, we found the wound by no means mortal or even dangerous. He then goes another mile, and the boat gets stuck, and they basically have to get out and hoist, pull, and try to lift it over a series of rocks and rapids. And so it was not a great start, but they kept going. September 1, 1803. We passed the little horsetail ripple, or riffle, with much difficulty. All hands labored in the water about two hours before we effected a passage. The next obstruction we met was the big horsetail riffle. Here, we were obliged to unload all our goods and lift the empty boat over. About five o'clock, we reached the riffle called Woolery's Trap. Here, after unloading again and exerting all our force, we found it impracticable to get over. I therefore employed a man with a team of oxen the assistance of which we at length got off. We put in and remained all night, having made only 10 miles this day. Fort Steuben on the Ohio River is an interesting point along the extension because Lewis solved another problem with the keelboat in a pretty creative fashion. Tell us about the keelboat a little bit and paint a picture of what happened there in Steubenville. Well, I, I think in a lot of ways, the, the keel boat has been referred to as a barge, and it probably was more like a barge. It was about 55 feet long, eight feet across, and it, it had a shallow draft somewhere between two, three feet. I mean, it was fully loaded a little bit deeper. And as you read the journals, you find out at points going down the Ohio River, they would actually unload it so they could move it over these rocks. But they get to Steubenville, and as per usual, they they were stuck again. In this particular case, they decided to hire a team of oxen and men to pull the boat through the, the rocky, shallow water to get unstuck. September 6th, we struck on a riffle about two miles below the town, hoisted our mainsail to assist in driving us over the riffle. The wind blew so hard as to break the spread of it, and now having no assistance but my manual exertion and my men worn down by perpetual lifting, I was obliged again to have recourse to my usual resort and sent out in search of horses or oxen. The oxen arrived, got off with difficulty. One of the biggest fears was that the Ohio River would be very low late in the summer, and that's exactly when Lewis was trying to traverse it. So tell us some more about the conditions of the Ohio. Well, the Ohio was a very important river for commerce. There were a lot of people that made their living on the river, transporting goods back and forth. And it it was really important, but at this point of the year, 
the water had dropped as it often did in fall, and it had a lot of rocky bars, or as Lewis calls them, riffles, that in low water times were protruding the water or just below the surface. So it was not a really navigable river uh, at that time of the year. So it was an extraordinarily poor time of year to try to take a boat down the river. And this is one of the reasons that Lewis had so many problems, particularly in the upper reaches of the Ohio River, where it tended to be shallower and more rocky. And Lewis makes a lot of entries about the conditions of the Ohio in his journal. So I guess you could describe the journey before the group reached the Missouri as a dry run. They weren't so much focused on gathering data and specimens as they were on figuring out how to solve the problems that they would undoubtedly see again and again. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I think it very much was a, we sometimes refer to this as a preparation route. And in some ways for the the travels up the Missouri and out to the Oregon coast. And they, they were trying to figure out not just how to use this boat, how to pack it, unpack it efficiently, how to, you know, they learned you can push it, you can pull it, you can run a sail on it. Uh, there are many ways to try to get it moving forward, and you have to employ all of them. One of the interesting things here was, at this point, they are going with the current, which, of course, when they turn, turn up the Missouri River a couple months later, or up the Mississippi River, and then into Missouri. From that point forward, for many months, all the way up to Fort Mandan in North Dakota, they're going against the current. But getting back to your question about learning about how to navigate the boat, how to use their equipment, how to keep things dry, was really important. They also acquired, a, they had one large canoe they referred to as a pirogue. They then acquired a second one, which leaked, and they had problems with guns rusting and things. But I think the other part that they were learning was how to be an effective team. And Lewis was, in many ways, not just trying out the boat, but he was trying out various men. In some cases, he would add men to the expedition, and then at the next town or down the way, he would send them on their way. Because he, for whatever reason, he didn't elaborate a lot, determined they were not suitable for this expedition. And this, I think, is important because he was in the process of handpicking a very select an important team to do this expedition. It wasn't just whoever showed up. It was very thoughtful and very considered decisions about who the right people were. And I think this process on the Ohio River of understanding what they were doing, not just with equipment, but also in terms of the types of people that were needed to make this happen is a real key to the later success they had. Because he did have in the end, the right team. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about the recruitment of the men in a little bit. But um, as you said, Lewis's preparation for the trip included much more than gathering the right supplies and the right men. He and Jefferson knew that his own education and a lot of different subjects was critical. So he spent many months with all kinds of doctors and scientists learning, like you said, about botany and maps and medicine and astronomy. And one of the points along the trail in Wheeling, West Virginia, he met with the son of one of the doctors who had worked with him, and the son could have been a real asset to the expedition. What was the story behind that? Well, he had dinner with this doctor who he'd known and a friend, and his son was very, very interested and exciting about it, excited about going on the expedition. And Lewis explained to him, you know, I really don't have authorization to have a doctor on this, but if you're willing to go with me, all the way to St. Louis, there I will reach out to Jefferson and, and try to seek his approval. And this is important for two things. You know, he was trying to still figure out which people he needed on this, but also this was very important because it was a clear admission at this point that he knew he was not going to be going up the Missouri this year. And so that's important. But he, he really wants this doctor. He offers it to him, and then the next day, this doctor, this doctor's son, did not show up. And Lewis waited for a while, and finally, being a, a person in, who takes action and in, in, is not always real patient, he shoved off. And so that doctor lost an opportunity. However, 
having said that, it seems that Lewis had acquired a great deal of medical skill and by most accounts did a, a very good job of caring for the men and people of the expedition and you know, was relatively successful in, in dealing with wounds and injuries and sickness along the journey. So I don't know if having a doctor would have made a big difference or not. It's interesting. But uh, it, it is one of those curiosities that uh, this doctor literally missed, missed this opportunity and missed the boat. Yeah, I wonder if that was a lifelong regret for that Dr. Patterson. <laughs> I don't know. That is an interesting question. Now, the Falls of the Ohio in Indiana is one important designation along the trail. William Clark was at his home in Clarksville, Indiana, near the Falls, and the plan was for Lewis to pick him up there. An entire month had elapsed since Lewis left Pittsburgh, and once he met Clark, they stayed put for two weeks. What was Clark doing during the entire month he was waiting for Lewis, and why then did they need to stay for two weeks in Clarksville after they met up? Well, one important reason that they were meeting here was this was also the home of William Clark's older brother, George Rogers Clark, who was a famous military leader in U.S. history. And I think, you know, this was an opportunity for William Clark to reconnect with his family and with his brother. I also think once Lewis got there, this was an opportunity to really recruit and check out various men to add to the expedition. And they looked at many, many different individuals. And this was also the first point where the two men were really together. They had an opportunity to discuss the expedition. They had an opportunity to discuss the kind of men they needed. And while we don't know those conversations, unfortunately, between William Clark, uh, George Rogers Clark, and Meriwether Lewis. It would have been fascinating, as Stephen Ambrose said, to have been able to sit there and listen to those conversations. But undoubtedly, they, they were sharing stories, they were talking about the expedition, and they were recruiting and selecting men for the rest of the journey. Let's talk more about the recruitment of the men who would serve in the Corps of Discovery what kind of qualifications were Lewis and Clark looking for? You know, I don't know that we know entirely what kind of the, the ideal person was. But if you look at the people that were picked, they, they had skills. In some cases, it was great physical strength and stamina. In some cases, it was river navigation. In other cases, it was hunting. And so, you know, it would have been nice to have, you know, had seen some type of roster that identified we need, you know, two of these types of skills and three of these and this type of men. And we don't really have a, a clear sense of exactly what they're looking for. But in general, I think it's safe to say that Lewis and Clark were very strategic. They wanted men that understood how to survive in the wilderness, who could navigate rivers, uh, who had skills hunting, who had various skills whether it be carpentry or blacksmithing, that would be of tremendous use and value. I think it was an extraordinarily thoughtful process, and I wish we knew a great deal more about kind of the criteria and thinking that Lewis had in who he wanted and exactly what he had in mind and why he made the decisions he did. We can speculate, but it would be nice to, to have more insight. What was the thought process in deciding the number of men needed for the expedition? The thought process seems to have evolved. Uh, initially, it was supposed to be a relatively small group, maybe a dozen men. Uh, in fact, a lot of people recommended that it be kept around that. Uh, there was concerns that sending a larger party than that uh, would be somewhat provocative or maybe perceived as threatening to American Indians and that they should go with a smaller group. Uh, Lewis seems to have abandoned that idea fairly quickly. And I, I, I don't know exactly when, but I think you, you definitely see that when you read the journals and look at his actions as he's going down the Ohio River. Uh, I think this becomes incredibly apparent to him and to Clark when they go, start going up the Mississippi, that, you know, it's, it, it's hard enough going down a river with the current during shallow water, low water times. But when you have to pull, push, and drag that boat, against the current of a very powerful meandering river, 
it, I think it just became abundantly clear to them they needed a much bigger crew. Fort Massac State Park in Metropolis, Illinois, and Fort Kaskaskia State Historical Site near Chester, Illinois, are historically important points on the trail extension. How did the stops at these military forts factor into the recruitment of additional volunteers, and in particular, one very essential member of the party? Well, I think one of the things that when they they arrived at these forts, they were interested and they had authority to basically bring soldiers into their mix. Uh, I think, you know, in some ways they were probably a little disappointed at their their opportunities of who they could select. George Drouillard or Drouillard, as as, uh, Mm -hmm. Lewis would sometimes write his name, I, I think was really important because he had the ability to speak different native languages. And so that was a very important skill that he was looking for. 11th November, arrived at Massac, engaged George Drewyer in the public service as an Indian interpreter, contracted to pay him $25 per month for his services. Mr. Swan, assistant military agent at that place, advanced him $30 on account of his pay. Now, the men headed onto the Mississippi River at Fort Massac. How was navigation on the Mississippi River compared to what they experienced on the Ohio? On the Mississippi, they, there was no lack of water. And the Mississippi at that time was a very meandering river. And so you would have to kind of go from side of the river to the other side of the river and always trying to find the, the slacker water with a weaker current as you're going around these oxbows and these bends in the river. It was, I think, very exhausting. And I really do think this is the point that really caused the captains to to recognize the need for more men because they understood from here all the way to Fort Mandan in North Dakota, they're gonna be fighting the current. November 16th, 1803. Passed the Mississippi this day and went down on the other side after landing at the upper habitation on the opposite side. We found here some Shawnees and Delawares in camp. One of the Shawnees, a respectable looking Indian, offered me three beaver skins for my dog, with which he appeared much pleased. The dog was of the Newfoundland breed one that I prize much for his docility and qualifications generally for my journey. And of course there was no bargain. I had given $20 for this dog myself. The Cahokia Courthouse in Cahokia, Illinois is another significant spot along the trail extension. How was the courthouse used and how did it tie into what was happening at the winter camp at Wood River? Did Lewis and Clark go back and forth between the two sites? They certainly did. They they used that kind of as a, a headquarters in some ways. I mean, they had their 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 camp and their fort at Camp River Dubois or Wood River, but the courthouse was kind of a great place to conduct business. It was a place to meet local leaders. It was to talk to people and get to know people that had been up the river and to get their information. And so it was kind of a central hub in some ways and in, in kind of an unofficial headquarters during the winter months. Cahokia, December 19th, 1803. On my arrival at Kaskaskia, I made a selection of a sufficient number of men from the troops of that place to complete my party. Made a requisition on the contractor to cause immediately an adequate deposit of provision to be made at Cahokia subject to further orders. So we talk a lot about the trip out to the West and the Pacific Ocean, but there's a lot of points that are interesting on the way back. Locust Grove in Louisville, Kentucky is a good example. It's part of the trail extension now because Lewis and Clark stopped there on November 8th, 1806, after their journey had finished. Tell me a little bit about Locust Grove and the reunion with family and home. Sure. I mean, Locust Grove was uh, founded in 1790, and his wife, Lucy, was a member of the Clark family. 
Uh, she was the sister of George Rogers Clark and William Clark. And so even though the expedition uh, had happened at this point, this was a place on their way back to the east that they stopped and they visited in November of 1806. And uh, it really was kind of a homecoming and it was, uh, you know, a family visit. And it was a, a you know, very nice place to stop and rest. And uh, I'm sure tell stories about the expedition and to become re- came, re- reacquainted with, with family. And uh, we consider it a very, very important site along the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail, even though it was not directly related to the expedition itself in 1803. Now, Lewis served under Clark in the Army for six months, and reportedly they were not good friends, but there must have been an enormous amount of respect for each other. What was it about the men's personalities and their strengths that allowed them to work together so well? I think both men were extraordinarily determined. I think they were very purpose-focused. They, they wanted to do something. They'd set out to do it. I think these were men of, of very strong physical stature. They were very capable in the wilderness, very comfortable in the wilderness. And I, you know, I think they just truly did respect each other. But I think one of the things we find is that in many ways, particularly during the expedition in the West, it becomes apparent they complemented each other. Clark particular was probably more of an extrovert, tended to connect better with the men. Uh, Lewis was a little bit aloof, and Lewis would often spend times walking on the shore and going off by himself. Together, they they formed a, a leadership team that was very well balanced and very successful. November 22nd, saw some heath hens or grouse. One of my men went on shore and killed one of them, of which we made some soup for my friend Captain Clark, who had been much indisposed since the 16th. How, in your opinion, did the pre-Missouri River part of the trip compare overall to the rest of the journey? I think it is a a very formative period of the expedition. I think it really was an opportunity for the men to learn to work together, to understand how to navigate a river, how to function as a team and how to use their equipment and tools and and test out a lot of the things, particularly that Meriwether Lewis had learned in the East. But when you start going up the Missouri River and you, you, it's a a different expedition. At this point, it was very much a diplomatic mission, an opportunity to, to study and learn and reach out to American Indian tribes. It also was very much focused on scientific discovery, gathering data and information. Uh, it was much more in, in the east and on the, the eastern legacy or the, the eastern extension of the trail. In some ways, that was rather known territory. That was less so going up the Missouri River and then much less so as they went west from Fort Mandan. What are the biggest lessons we can learn from how these men pulled off this enormous undertaking? Well, I I think you can't underestimate the importance of having the right team. I think having good leadership was critical. Bringing in handpicking and selecting the very best people they could for this expedition was critical. Having a very clear sense of purpose, they knew what they intended to do, and an absolute determination to do it. You know, it, it, it's one thing to have an idea of what you want to do, but to be so committed and so focused that almost without question, we're going to do this. This is just the task ahead of us, and we're going to make it happen. Uh, it, you know, and with the right team and with the right leadership, you can do that. What do you hope the trail extension will achieve in telling the overall story of Lewis and Clark? Well, for me, one of the real tremendous values of having this extension, it helps people understand that the Lewis and Clark story started in the eastern United States. I think there are a lot of people in in the states along the extended trail that probably didn't really know Lewis and Clark had been there or that anything related to Lewis and Clark happened. And I think a lot of people I've talked to always kind of thought about this as a Western story. 
this is a transcontinental story that that starts in the east, really gets underway full force in Pittsburgh, and goes to the west coast. And so I think for me, it's an opportunity to increase people's awareness of this expedition and for people to understand that they may live a lot closer to this story than they ever realized, in that it's not some story that happened far off in the West. This is a story that that happened much closer to home than they realize. There's so many interesting things that happened to these men during the course of this expedition. Really some fascinating stuff. What do you personally think are some of the most amazing things that happened in the during the expedition? Well, I, I think the fact that they were as successful as they were, only one person lost their life on the expedition. That's amazing. I, I really do find the stories and experiences and writings about York, William Clark's slave to be fascinating and interesting, particularly his interaction with Native Americans and how they responded to him and revered him in many cases is is very fascinating, very interesting. Uh, I think the story of Sacagawea is an incredible story. Uh, I think we probably know just a tiny bit that there is to know about her, but we get glimpses that she too was an extraordinary person. She was an important part of the expedition. And, you know, in in the West, when she's sitting there around the campfire and realizes the chief they're talking to is her brother that she hadn't seen for many years. That's an extraordinary moment that, you know, as, as people have said, you know, you really couldn't make this stuff up. It's so extraordinary. Every day I'm learning about the Lewis and Clark Trail and the expedition. There's so much to know. Uh, I long ago realized I would never know everything I wanted to know and never know all of it. I am hoping that as time goes forward and people become more aware of this, we will learn more from the people along the trail. National Historic Trails are very much a collaboration of partners. Uh, We are working very hard to create opportunities and materials to help travelers get out and to help businesses and historic sites put their information on a website we're creating to help travelers navigate the trail. And I think as we do that, we may learn about sites or hear stories or find out about things that people are going to say, well, you know, didn't you know about whatever? And we may very likely say, you know what? We didn't. We'd love to hear that story. We'd love to know more about it. We'd love to make people know, help people know about it. So we are still very much on a journey of discovery uh, with the western portions of the trail, and especially the extended trail, which has really only been part of the National Park Service now, just a little bit over a year. So, uh, you know, every day is still an adventure for us and my staff, and uh, I, I think we will keep learning things, and I think we're going to find out that, yes, we have missed parts of the story. We have, you know, so much more to learn every day. Mark, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. The Lewis and Clark story never ceases to amaze, and the trail extension highlights so many more interesting and imperfect steps of the early part of the journey. Thank you for sharing some of those highlights, and stay safe. Well, Lynn, thank you so much more for the opportunity to talk about one of my very favorite subjects. Uh, I, I I think I could always talk and talk all day about the Lewis and Clark expedition and the people that are part of it. So thank you for this opportunity. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. As always, if you have an idea for our podcasts, please forward it to us via news at nationalparkstraveler.org. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Rabincheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. <laughs>
Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.